I'm excited to be here. I think this is an exciting topic, and I'm, I think, thrilled that we have such a diverse array of experts here from um, a Los Angeles dealer, Megan, a, a very experienced advisor, and Alan, who's been collecting for quite a while. Um, and I wanted to just start by having some, have each panelist say a little bit about what they've been up to, what they're doing, and kind of like why we're here today and why they're qualified to discuss this great topic about the future of the art market. So um, Suzanne, would you like to start? Um, sure. <laughs> Um, well, I'm here because uh, we're exhibiting at the Armory Show, and we have been very loyal to this fair for over 20 years. Um, I'm not entirely sure how qualified I am to talk about the future, but uh, I've, I've, I've been um, having a gallery for a long time, and I've seen many ups and downs in the art market. And we, uh, yeah, so I'm excited to be on the panel and thank you so much for having me. Great, thank you. And Megan. Thank you, Eileen. Um, I'm here too because of the fair and you know, enjoyed the you know, first opening day and seeing everything, bringing clients here. Um, it's part of our job. Um, I, I'm interested in talking about the future because my clients are constantly asking me about the future. The future is really what informs a lot of their decisions. And my own approach is looking toward the future with an eye to the past. You know, what has happened before? As Suzanne said, the art market, like any market, goes through cycles. So where are we now? And based on what we've known from the past, where do we expect we're going to be going? Or where do we hope we're going to be going? Mm -hmm. Alan? Um. Contrary to them, I just saw light, so I decided to come, and then they put me in, in front of you, so um, that's the reason. Um, and it's important that I'm an investment banker in life, so I'm the guy trying to understand the world, contrary to trying to make $1 becoming $3, but uh, we're also trying to understand the world and to know the future. So my approach to the art market, which is totally different to my collecting, is, is different. I'm trying to understand the process. and, and and contrary, um, I don't think we are in a cycle. I think we are to, in a radical change uh, of the art market right now um, that I, I call the transformation from a, a craft time. You know, Leo Castelli was a, a wonderful craftsman. Uh, like, we had someone doing shoes by hand and everything. So a gallerist was, I think, at the time. And Suzanne, like me, is coming from that time um, yeah, to something that is becoming industrialized. Um, and where the process is more important, and particularly two important processes, the branding. Sometimes the branding of the gallery is bigger than the, than the branding of the artists. And the second is the importance of the economies of scale. Um, two, two very important elements is that doing so many fairs, having so many fixed costs, needs that you, if you don't manage to uh, spread out your costs, and spreading out your costs means that if you build the brands, you can spread it out to different cities, to different countries, to a multiplicity of artists. So it becomes an industry, and that's a massive change because the danger of all this, and that's where maybe we're going to uh, get at one point, is that the art, uh, which was something um, creative and original, is becoming commodified. You know, it's the same art that is the demand at one point and is repeated over and over again. So. Um, that's a little bit the, the basic observation I'm starting from. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to, to kick off with was um, to take a, a little bit of a look back. Like when I first started writing about art, it was in the late 90, 1990s. I was at the Wall Street Journal, and they had a high bar about what you could cover about the art market. So there was a lot of great stuff going on that I, I was like pitching to them. They weren't quite getting unless it was like a $10 million Picasso or a Jasper Johns. Um, Kudos to Kelly Crow, because she has really carved out an amazing beat there. But over the years, it has gone from you know me there worrying about what to write about to just not being able to keep up with the sheer amount of growth in galleries, growth in art fairs. Um, you know, we, we did mention mega galleries, like that there's too much to write about. We, we can barely keep up on a daily basis about like what lawsuit we're gonna co cover or what art fair. I'm curious, like through the lens, for each of you, how that shift has happened and how like a day today differs than what it was when you first opened up in 
Los Angeles, and Suzanne has been there for over 30 years in Los Angeles. That's another question we'll get to later is the mega expansion out there. But if you could like describe similar shifts in, in your daily routine. Uh, uh, of course, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the just the sheer amount of activity that's being asked from us as dealers is uh, often overwhelming. So uh, very often, I, I see there are some dealers here who have a booth and two other project solo booths at this fair and perhaps simultaneously at another fair. We in Los Angeles just opened one solo show, then we all rushed here for the fair. When we come back, we open two more solo shows because we have usually three simultaneous exhibitions going on. Uh, every night we go to a dinner or to a collector's home. Very often in the morning, I have breakfasts with artists. All of that is a little, it's like, a mu multiple times um, of what we used to do. Um, it's also, from a gallery point of view, necessary to be able to stay competitive. In the very big picture, I find it difficult to think that inherently there is something wrong with a very vibrant and huge art market. It becomes more challenging to navigate it because there's so much more to see and nobody, people get insecure because they don't know. There's, there are so many choices. What should I buy or what should I even look at? But if you look at it from a point of view of a large historical art of successful civilizations, the ones that were leaning heavily on art production and making art and looking at art and selling art were not the ones that failed. You know, you could we could spend all a lot of money on making war. So I prefer it this way. I think we're all sometimes exhausted and we're complaining and we don't know what to do and what to look at. But overall, I think people it's maybe helpful to remember that all of this is a very good thing. We, I don't think there has ever been that much culture and art around us that we could easily access and enjoy and look at. And, and, and I feel strongly that is something that should be celebrated first and foremost. <laughs> That's great. And one thing I want to add to that, sometimes if people tell me that the art world is not democratic, I say, you can spe spend your Saturday, and people are sometimes intimidated, you can spend your Saturday walking in and out of galleries all day in Chelsea for free. For free. Um, and same thing in, Lo well, Los Angeles, you probably need to drive, but, but you yeah. can walk in and out and see wonderful shows for yeah. not, not a penny. And if you don't enjoy it, there's a very simple choice for you, just don't do it. But, you know, it's, it's not, I think, as I said, in a larger context, I don't feel it's something to be extremely, you know, sad about. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I, I would totally agree yeah. with you. And Megan? Uh, agreed. I mean, the volume has magnified. And it has even more so, I think, since 2020, when the need for more digital forms of communication in order to stay present, in order to know what Bill Meiter, you know, gallery is, is, is doing, or any other gallery around the world. Um, so the volume of communications that come in, the volume of information that comes in can be overwhelming. But part of our job, you know, as a, an advisory firm is to uh, filter and create discernment around, you know, the uh, create a hierarchy really of the levels mm -hmm. of, of information that are coming in that are relevant to our clients. And of course, every client is different. Every client's goals, tastes, interests are different. So it's tailoring that information, you know, for each of them. Um, but I have to agree with Suzanne that the, ex the expansion of the art market is not all bad. Um, it is in the sense that it perhaps creates confusion. Um, but more and more people are reading about art, hearing about art, seeing, um, you know, getting emails and getting, you know, information about the art market. And more people are curious. And while definitely much of what we read about is the 1% of the 1%, you know, economically. Um, I think that there are, again, 
lots of different levels that, are pe that people are able to engage in art. It doesn't all have to be the record-breaking you know, painting at auction that makes you a part of the art world or a part of the art market. It's engagement just like this, you know, this Saturday here at this fair. Yeah, that's great. And Alan? Um, I entered the arts uh, without any background into it from Wall Street. Uh, I started my career down, down the line here in 1987. Um, and I entered art because it kind of broadened my view of the world. Because, uh, you know, when you're Wall Street, you've got a pretty narrow view of the world. Um, and we were not talking about money. Um, so what changed in the last 20 years is that we only speak about money. And, and Megan is saying yes to me about uh, many things I'm saying. So it's the truth as well. So what changed dramatically is the amount of money. Again, I don't like generalizations and, and, and heuristic statements about the beauty of the art and everything. The, the reality is the following. I made an analysis back a few years ago. Uh, I looked at contemporary art defined as um, art created by artists uh, born after 1960. Um, in 2005, the total amount of, of, um, of contemporary art at auction around the world was $48 million in 2005, $48 million. I could not believe when I saw that figure. In 2008, so only three years later, the same question was $860 million. So it multiplied by 23 in three years. So it's very easy to speak about, it's just more information, it's just more this, no, it happened something very big is that something happened in two, between 2005 and 2008, is that the amount of money getting in art went from 48 to, eight, to 860, I'm talking about contemporary art. This is changing everything, because before that, nobody cared about art. You know, I'm collecting for 25 years, like Suzanne, active in there too, um, and nobody cared, nobody spoke about art, nobody thought you know, about reselling in many ways. You know, I attended the transformation of the art market with people like Philip Segalo, Dominic Levy, uh, Amy Capellazzo, that brought for the very first time contemporary art into the auction house. I saw the first um, Basquiat selling for $1 million around 2005, and it was supposed to be a con because it was supposed to be a fake thing. So the enormous transformation that happened is that money came in and ruled. This money is coming, you know, what is very important is that art for me is nothing outside of the general society. You know, it's just a tiny reflection of society at large. What changed in society at large is the concentration of wealth. You are all aware of it, all of you here. So what happened is that the concentration of wealth among the 1% and the even more in the 0.1% grew bigger. And this 0.1% bought fancy cars, real estate and real estate, and they started buying art. And the drama for art was that as they didn't know nothing about art, they bought art like they used to buy it something else, which was fashionable and social recognition, which means that the art became um, a secondary element versus the social recognition and um, the investment uh, potential. And I would like just to remind one thing, is that I came into art following you know, a description like Hans Ulrich Hobrich said one day. And I really think about this definition. Hans Ulrich Hobrich said, art is the best defense against annihilation by standardization. I repeat, the best defense against annihilation by standardization. The problem is that today, most of the art is commodified. It's the same. And I'll be simply honest. On this fair, there's so many paintings that looks like the painting in the next booth that is frightening, okay? So we need to go back to a definition of art, and that is what of my difficulty for the future is, is how are going to we preserve art in the context of the art market industrialization? So I repeat, I came into art to avoid, to escape money, and now I'm trying to push back money out of my, my beloved art. I have to agree with I, I, Alain a lot on this. Okay. <laughs> I have to agree with you completely. The other thing that 
we're seeing about all the information and you know the kind of questions that I'm asked, whether it's from you know journalists or from clients, collectors, etc., often have to do about money. You know, if we look at headlines, headlines are very often about money. When we look at you know a, a summary of what has you know just gone on in the last quarter in the in the art market or this you know first little over a half of a year is you know is the market down because we're measuring what happened with you know with the auctions in May, right? As if that is the only measure of what's going on. The auctions in May have nothing to do with what Suzanne is doing at her gallery. It has nothing to do with you know, the private sales that may or may not be going on from the auction houses and from the galleries. But the headers and the drivers, the sort of, sorry, but like the clickbait on yeah. articles and emails and everything else, it's all about you know, something with a dollar sign or a, or a euro sign in front of it. Yeah, I, I mean, I would agree. And there, there is a pressure for us to cover auctions very carefully because they are really the only public barometer. Um, like we could walk around and ask prices here and get a sense of what's selling and what's popular. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's Artnet's bread and butter, plus we run an auction database. So for, for better or for worse, we go to them, we track them carefully. And um, one of the things that Katya wrote in her column that I thought was very interesting when she wrote about um, Bargain City recently was that yeah, things are down a little bit last year, but the Maclo collection is a once-in-a-lifetime collection that you're never going to see again. I mean, it was the result of a contentious divorce. Exactly. And the masterpieces they had. So it's, it is issues of cycles, and it's issues of supply and demand. So it's not necessarily, not even a negative thing, but, I mean, you have Paul Allen, Paul, Paul Allen's collection and Maclo in one year. Of course, there's going to be a little bit of a, of a dip after that. That's... That's my two cents about, about no. the auction. Yeah, but you're talking about the Paul Allen collection, and uh, the the big one of the big problem, and we're talking about your profession, uh, Aileen, mm -hmm. is that <clears throat> you started from the Wall Street Journal, so that's interesting. You came into art, and then you forgot everything you learned at the Wall Street Journal. Not necessarily, no. I think you did, <laughs> because did. Um, <laughs> the thing is that in the Paul Allen uh, collection sales, the most interesting was what could we learn about it, about the fact that art is a very bad investment. You know why? Why? Because in that sales, there was about 60 works, and about 30 of them were resale, which means that we know at what price he bought them at auction. Mm -hmm. okay? So if you looked at the 30 lots of this major collector, the best of the best with the most money, and... Um, the fact that it's only his best works, because of course the, the shit works, he cannot sell them at auction. I mean, mm -hmm. they're still there somewhere under the mattress, and you're going to have to put them on the sidewalk to get rid of them, okay? So, I'm serious. Okay, it's only the best, okay? But in that best, in the 30 works, the average holding period, so the average um, number of years that he had to keep them was 15 years. It's not a short-term investment, okay? Mm -hmm. 15 and the average return he made on those 15 years of holding was something around 7% mm -hmm. on the 30 lots, okay? 7%, that's 3% under the S&P on that period, okay? So honestly, it's a shit investment. Mm -hmm. So the problem is nobody wrote about it because everybody said 1 billion, ah, la la, million, million. I mean, we deserve, and that's the problem of the profession of the art reporters, because it was not the object of this, but that's very necessary, that everybody talks about the financialization of the art markets. That's the key word, financialization of the art market. Except that the reporters are looking at it like art historians. And if they were looking at it like we do, then suddenly things would come up and they would help the, the public to see what is actually going on besides the big headline and the marketing of the auction house that is very powerful, that is just hiding everything, like the withdrawal lots, you know, the new fashion of taking the lots out so that the totals looks better. I mean, plus the guarantees, which makes that the auction, the evening auction is a kind of a chore choreographed private sale and nothing else. I mean, sorry, help us to see this. I mean, I well, see we, it. We do try to, to, to look at those numbers. I actually do. Um, monitor the withdrawn lots very carefully and also I've done a ton of reporting on guarantees and how much that games the market and how much speculation that in introduces. So I'm, I'm well aware of that. I try to be transparent about that when I'm covering auctions. Yeah, but I, had to I, I would like to say something in response to what you said. You, you mentioned 
that uh, everything is about money and nobody knows, you seem to imply that nobody knows the real art or what art means anymore and that we need to redefine art. I would like to say something to that. Uh, I do think that we're actually in the very middle of a major redefinition of art in so far, and, and this is the most radical change that I have seen in 23 years. I have wanted this for 23 years, and it is actually happening now. And that is that art is being redefined simply through the fact that the art world, the artists, the art market, the art buyers has become hugely more diverse. And what that means is that that traditional understanding that we used to have of art, which was incredibly Eurocentric, it was incredibly male-centric, that through the pandemic has actually finally broken up. And there are, is a huge influx of new voices, of new opinions through social media that's coming in and flooding the market. And of course, that makes traditional positions unstable and insecure, and it should. I think this was long overdue to happen. It's happening now, and I think it is something that we should welcome and that should give us um, the motivation to actually go back and learn and look. And you know, I go through the fairs, I have my long established categories, my internal categories about how to discern what is good, what is quality, what is it that my clients should buy, what is it that I should show. And all of this right now is in flux. And the old parameters are not working anymore and I think it's high time that we all go back and learn and listen. There are so many new voices now out there and it always starts with the artists but there are new collectors out there. They come in with a very different agenda. Mm -hmm. They come in with a very different world view and I think it's a world view that we all sorely need because we're right now a little bit in the process of destroying our world. And that is what's happening. Yeah, there are very wealthy people who only talk about money and they buy a lot of art. That has always been the case. I cannot think of a historical point in time where art was not bought by wealthy people. That has always been the case. At the same time, I don't think there has ever been a time where art has been accessible for not so wealthy people, and that's also happening right now. So I feel, again, what I said earlier, right now I think it's the time for celebration and for conversation and for widening and learning, widening our horizon and, and learning, and that's at least what I'm focusing that, on, right? That's a very Great. interesting <laughs> po in point, but would you call it because you said, oh, we are in a new definition of art, but you didn't define it in other way that it's a broader appeal, if, am I right? So I would say it has to be a definition that is different, that has a different point of view, a more inclusive point of view, uh, and, 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 a, and a point of view that isn't so much looking to our European history. What that new definition is, I cannot tell you because we, you know, we're still, I think right now, we're all in a process of searching. And uh, that I don't think is a bad thing. As a collector, can I help you maybe? Or you will help me to tell me if I'm right or wrong because you know, it's easy to speak in terms of popularization of art, okay? Meaning a broader appeal, it's fine. It's, and it's overdue in terms of diversity. But in terms of popularization, I'm not sure. And this is getting to the core of the, of the debate, which is the future of the art market. Because we're gonna have two different views between Suzanne and me. 
because she will speak about popularization of art, and I will say that art is not elitist, it has never been, mm -hmm. but there's one thing that is always striking me. You know, a movie like The Square, the famous The Square, the movie that was supposed to speak about the art market, won the Golden Palm in, in, um, in Cannes, uh, got 10,000 lines in every magazine in the world. The total revenue of that movie after five years around the world was $40 million, okay? So it is supposed to be elitist because nobody goes to watch it. Barbie does a million and a billion and a half in one month. So do we have to go to Barbie to broaden the appeal of the arts? Or do we have to agree that art is about making us think differently, or maybe starting to make us think. Because the society, the way it's structured, is about not making us uh, thinking, just giving us impulse, you know, a little bit of uh, adrenaline here, a little like on an Instagram, a little compliment there, a little this or that, you know, or does it has to push us outside of our comfort zone? And the problem is that there's only a minority of people, it doesn't matter now or previously, there's only a minority of people that like to be challenged and put outside of their comfort zone. The same about dressing differently, about eating different food, about going on holiday somewhere else than the Hamptons, and so on, and so on, and so on. So it's simply about being different. So me, I'm defending the art that pushes people to go outside of their comfort zone. And I the one that you're broadening the appeal, because when you say, you, when you're defining it to yourself, oh, one thing is sure, I don't want the definition, the Eurocentric definition of the past. This makes me think, to be honest and to be very blunt, about the kind of thing, the movement I hear in politics against the institutions. All I want to be is that this institution, the way it works, doesn't work anymore. This is called populism. Simply populist. I think there's room for both. I'm not saying everybody needs to make, you know, the artist should be making work that everybody loves and, you know, that takes three seconds to understand. And if anybody knows anything about my gallery, they also know that my program stands for the absolute opposite of all of this. We, <laughs> we have never shown what everybody wanted at the time. That's the reason why I also am not having a gallery in Hong Kong, Zurich, London, and who knows where. I have a gallery in LA. Yet, I would not have the opinion that what I do as a gallerist is simply because I do it, quality and what other galleries are doing is simply not so great or what other artists are doing. There's room for everything. You know, if somebody likes conceptual, intellectual, political work that, that derives from a long Western European tradition, they, you know, can fall in love with that and they can follow that. What I am fundamentally, what I fundamentally find problematic and that all of that is actually breaking up right now is that our past has been defined by these parameters of quality and the people who set the parameters of what good art is and what not so good art is happened accidentally to be the people who were also always in power. And all of that is breaking up. And with social media, everybody can participate in the conversation. I am not saying we need to, you know, say what everybody has to say is the new standard now, but I think you can have a more interesting conversation if you have more voices participating, and that is what's happening right now, and I think it's long overdue. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I tend to, <laughs> to view that way. Alan, I'm curious, with so much information coming at you and you know, your view of like this heavy focus on financialization, how do you make decisions about what you like and what you're going to acquire and, and live with, what, like especially in this day and age now? It's, um, you know, 
one of my mentor, uh, Herman Dallet, who eventually sold this collection to the MoMA, an extremely important conceptual art collection, he said, you know, the difficulty with um, contemporary art is that you need to um, clean yourself up of fashion. So it's a continuously a mental exercise about saying, oh, this is every, what everybody likes, this is what every, every gallerist is throwing at me, mm -hmm. and this is what I need to clean up, okay? So when I go, when you go, it's the same as going to a shopping mall. You know, it's about, will I go for the same T-shirt that as everybody, what, but everybody wears it, so, you know, I'm going to look cool with that T-shirt or those shoes or whatever. So the first effort is really a mental exercise to clean yourself up. Where I clean myself up very much is in the museums and the biennials, which means I start from there, okay? So I do a lot of them because those curators, very often, they, they know their job. They've been studying for a long time. They do more research than me. They visit more studios of artists than me, like some galleries do, except the galleries, they've got to bring to the fair what they will sell because they paid 50 to $70,000. They have no choice. They must show what will sell, not sometimes what they like, what they sell. I see it, for example, here from my European colleagues. I mean, all of them are sometimes conceptual galleries. They bring only paintings in New York because they say, you need to bring paintings to sell. Mm -hmm. So it's fashion, okay? So the first thing is cleaning up myself by going to, uh, to biennials and things. And i give you an example. After leaving this, I'm going to meet Pepon Osorio, who I discovered a new, mu new museum, this fantastic exhibition on the first floor of the new museum, and I will probably buy one of the work that is currently in the museum, okay? And, it, you know, it's a different way of approaching, but we need to resist the market. Mm -hmm. And, Megan, I'm sure that that's an issue when you're advising your clients. Like, I was wondering um, two things. How you guide when you have questions about ultra-contemporary and if you have more than you can even work with? Like, do you have to set a cap on who you work with and, and make decisions about what their goals and intentions are? I do have to set a cap, because there's only so much capacity you have, mm -hmm. um, you know, just to serve the people who are relying on you. So I do set a cap, and, and it usually has to do with their goals. Um, but I think that for myself and for other advisors that I know, People come to me, people come to them because they, they sort of have a sense of, you know, how it is that I work, how I run my business. And with some conversations, you discover what their goals are and whether your goals meet, meet up. I don't, I don't tend to get or attract that collector who says, you know, I want to buy things and sell things and I want to make money in the, in the market. That's like, that's like not my guy or not my girl, right? They, they just don't come to me. It's more people who want to learn, people who are curious, uh, or people who know a lot but who want to you know, work on more you know, refining their collection, expanding it in certain ways. Um, and so you know, it, it, it's a lot of what, it, to what uh, Suzanne and Alain were just saying, um, continuous learning is one of the foundations of my practice. It's what I also tell all the staff who work with me. It's the thing that we have to always be doing. And it's, it's, it's easy, especially when you've been around as long as I have been, um, to sort of sit back and rely on those things that you feel that you know. And you make certain assumptions, right? And so experience might inform how I advise. But I try to approach every you know, biennial, every exhibition, every art fair, every you know, auction season with a certain amount of uh, and maybe this is what you were saying, cleans cleansing yourself, Ellen, you know, a, a certain openness and almost pretending at naivete, right? Because then you are actually allowing yourself to look at something for the first time and being more open to it and trying to look at it through the lens of the collector whose goals you're looking to meet, right? So it's not about me or what I like, or what my taste is, or what my biases are, anything like that. It's really about me putting me away mm -hmm. and looking through their eyes mm -hmm. and trying to find the things that will make, that will make the most sense for them. And Do you think a lot of that comes from your muse museum background and having like, worked at a museum and I, understanding the need for curiosity and openness? I think so, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly learning. And um, 
I, I do, as I said to you earlier, I have a podcast about art books, and so once a month, I interview an author, a, a, you know, who's written a, a new art a book about art that I find, you know, compelling, and it forces me to read. And um, I was talking to a colleague um, recently, and I said, you know, I read a book a week. And really, that's been since the pandemic. I mean, I had this stack, you know, next to the bed of all the art books that we all get. And I just was like, I was reading a book a week, and it's a habit that I have kept up. Now, some of them take longer than a week, but I'm basically, you know, I have two or three going at a time. Mm -hmm. I'm getting through a book a week. It's, it's a tremendous amount mm -hmm. of just learning and absorbing, but a practice that maybe I fell out of a number of years ago. And so constantly learning and constantly you know, um, researching in order to make more informed decisions for my clients is, is again, the foundation of our practice. I think it's what we have to do. Um, going back to what we said in the very beginning, what's changed and the volume of information that comes, I think that's where it gets tricky because you have all this coming in and how do you create, you know, for yourself a prioritization about what you're going to look at and pay attention to? I would like to add something to that because the amount of information has so incredibly increased. Of course, the act of filtering or curating or selecting from this mountain of information has also become much more important. And um, there, I think, uh, there are so many different ways how you can go about it, and that I find very exciting. Um, again, I think a fundamental change there again is, and I see that everywhere, I see it in the institutions, I see it sometimes in the private collections, I definitely see it in the programs that galleries show that there has been a shift away from I go by standards of what I have learned, what quality means by a few experts in the art world who define that, or um, to a much more um, acute awareness of inequalities that have long persisted in the art world, inequalities that have long persisted actually in our society and that there is some how all of a sudden now and this you know I, it's perhaps difficult to understand for people that this was not there before the pandemic that there's a, a new consciousness about what at least amongst galleries and museums what is our responsibility in terms of providing a aesthetic experience to our audience? Is it okay that I simply say, well, I'll show whatever I like, or I'll show whatever I think is great, or is there more? Is there perhaps, I mean, museums definitely are in the process of looking very hard of what is actually our role and whom are we responsible, whom are we responding to and what is our obligation here? Um, and I think that kind of questioning about what is it actually that I'm showing and presenting and is there such a thing as a responsibility to my audience that has now also spilled over into what a lot of galleries are doing. And some people might think this is opportunistic. Why is a gallery that I never cared about those issues all of a sudden doing this? My point of view is, is the more people are doing it, the better. I don't care where they're coming from and what their thinking is. I think we are in a very exciting time where people are having those thoughts, where they're thinking, what I'm showing, this creative output that I'm showing in this cultural context should have some sort of connection with the makeup of the audience and where they're coming from and what experience they can actually relate to. I think that's a very important change that's happening right now and that I very much welcome. That's great. And um, to, just to pivot a little bit, Suzanne, you and I were talking um, you know, I'm kind of fascinated with the ex expansion, the rapid expansion that's happening in LA, and there seems like 
there's so much energy there um, and a lot of big names coming in. But you were commenting the other day about how you feel like each, each different size of gallery can play a role in an artist's career and kind of like that there's room for everyone in the art ecosystem, even though I know yeah. there's a lot of competition. Right. You could talk a little bit about yeah. that. Well, as you probably future. all have gathered, uh, I, I, I like to have a pretty positive outlook on things. Uh, but I think this ties very much into what you said, Elaine. Of course, there's this, because the art market has grown so hugely, there are some galleries who have grown enormously, and there's always this, you know, talk about that the biggest galleries are eating up everybody else, and that there are, you know, that all of this has turned into this super corporate business and all of that. All of that is true, and all of that is, of course, problematic. I do think, see hope, because I'm a hopeful and optimistic person. I, I do think that sometimes people get overwhelmed and they forget that the, the art market is not a machine or a beast that does whatever it does. The mar art market is us. And I think the, the crucial pinnacle of the art market is actually the artist. So if an artist is put in a position where they're being told you can only succeed if at some point you go with the five biggest galleries, we all know who they are, then that, of course, creates a very difficult situation for the rest of the, the artists who will never get to that point and, and also very much to the art buyers who will never be able to afford those prices. And most of all to the rest of us galleries because we will be then condemned to basically do the expensive work of building the careers and once there's money to be made, they get the artists get picked, like we're the plum trees ready for the picking and the money is being made somewhere else. I, I think we're again at a very interesting point in time where some collectors are realizing that maybe it was a revolutionary act to buy a work from Hauser and Wirt 10 years ago is that really that revolutionary right now? In the same way that maybe your super cool Prada outfit from 20 years ago was really, you know, cutting edge. If you buy it now, is that really so cutting edge? So um, there are more and more artists who are realizing Every gallery at every stage can actually bring something useful to my career. This very young gallery that will never be able to pay my production costs can still connect me with a young audience that is at the very cutting edge of the tomorrow conversation. The mid-career gallery can be maybe the gallery that I grew up with, that I trust the most, that I can cry my eyes out when my partner leaves me and they will always be there for me. <laughs> the mega gallery could perhaps be that gallery that pays if I should be selected to have the US pavilion in Venice. They could swoop in and pay the production costs for that. So, more and more artists are realizing that perhaps it doesn't have to be this either or situation. Perhaps they can, and the artists are the ones who have the power to negotiate that. And more and more artists are actually doing that. It's the same for collectors. Perhaps, you know, you get your ego tickled to the core that the senior sales director of Gagosian actually talks to you. Perhaps you find it also once in a while interesting to talk to a very young gallerist that nobody has ever heard of and, you know, they will love you forever. I think we're in a moment where these structures can break up and the art market is big enough, I think, 
to help most of us. That's great. I, I really appreciate that. Alan, you want to say something? I'm not sure that there's enough money for everyone, contrary to what you say, because it's very heuristic description. You know, it's everything, love, and... But she's also talking about it, connections, too. Like, if you don't yes, have the money, of course, about connect connections and like the whole thing. But the fact is the following. Uh, there was that study of Sotheby saying that... Um, um, the works of art for a million dollars and plus represent 70% of the art market. 70%. Mm -hmm. Are you selling works of art above a million dollars or around? No. no. Okay, no. so it's not concerning you. So this means that the market is 70% of this. We talk, because we're talking about the market here. We're not talking about the, the heuristic pleasure of art and the whole thing. We're talking about the art market. Is it, Eileen? It's about the art market, huh? It's not about sure. art today. The subject, but, I mean, I but, mean, the subject is about the art market. But we, but, but we make the art market. I mean, if we, all, if we all now say we will never ever buy a work of art again, what's the art market going to do? No, we're talking about the future of the art market. So the future of the art market is that concentration is among those players, okay? And the mm -hmm. thing is, what will happen, because... This art that you're describing in a very heuristic way is under threat. And that's where we, we end up agreeing, even if probably we don't agree on that kind of art. But that's exactly the same threat. Because that concentration of power among the big players is the evolution. Okay? It's easy to speak about, again, you know, many, many things. But the fact is... 70% of the market is 1 million and more. And this is in the hands of probably 25, 30 galleries among, according to Clara McAndrew, 45,000 dealers in the world. So as you see, there is probably 40 galleries making 75% of the turnover, which means that you get the crumbles, okay? I'm, I'm very aware of Good. getting the crumbles. So, <laughs> and, and because of that, you think that you have to go to art fairs to meet new clients and meet new other clients than in Los Angeles, which is more interested in bodybuilding and very tight uh, clothing. Happen and to disagree with that. <laughs> than culture, okay? Because this is Los Angeles still, okay? I, I go there sometimes and that's the case, contrary to what some people may, may think here. So you come here or you come to Europe to do that. So you are forced to do the fairs, but you pay the same amount per square meter as the big guys at the other end. So at the end, you are threatened. And that's what I'm trying to say, is that in this evolution of this industrialization of the art market, if there's not a change, the real art from you or from the young galleries you're describing maybe will not appear because the only thing you will be able to show in those environments will be what pleases people. And that's the danger, uh, that's the, the challenge for the future. Okay, we have to wrap it up soon, but Alan, I do think that's kind of a worst case scenario. I, I, I appreciate some of the optimism, so I, you know, I'm trying to mediate here. But um, we're gonna wrap it up, but um, in about t we have about 10 minutes left for questions, so if anybody has any questions. But it's recorded for Artnet, so they need to have your voice. Hi, thank you for the talk. It's very interesting. Um, I thought the point about museums was really interesting as well. I wanted to kind of open it up and talk a bit about how the art market is also shaping museums in a new way. I remember, I mean, before COVID, there was an exhibition at Tate which was sponsored by White Cube of one of their artists. And it was coincidentally at the same time, they also had a show of that artist at White Cube and at the Tate at the same time. So maybe you could speak a bit more to how galleries and have started to kind of shape also the museum over and exhibitions and maybe ha has that 
kind of created a new space in the museum to kind of influence the art market or use it to boost sales, which I find also kind of, is that contrary to what a museum is or is that kind of a sign of the times? Did you want to, uh, me to answer that question? Um, yeah, you can both answer. Mm -hmm. You go first. I think it depends on what the exhibition is or was and whether you know how it began. So very often galleries are needing to support or even artist endowed foundations are needing to support uh, exhibitions you know, by their artists because you know, there's only so much money that the, the, the museum itself can raise. So the question is, I think the root of the question is, did the impetus for the show come from the curator who really wanted to do that exhibition about that artist and do the book and do the tour and everything else and the gallery happened to sponsor it? Or did the gallery go to the museum and say, we want a show of this artist? And I think we'd have to look at every single specific case because many of the artist endowed foundations that I advise are, and because that's the other part of what I do, um, are asked to help and support exhibitions that museums are driving um, and that they want to do by the artist. So they're having to support it and they're going to support it themselves as the foundation and often the gallery that represents that artist endowed foundation is also going to support to the extent that they can. Um, so it, it's where did the root come from? Are, are the galleries really driving the museum shows or are they supporting the shows that the museums already want to do? Um, I, I think what you are saying is actually a very um, important and pretty severe problem because right now in the United States, and I think it's happening in Europe too, the funding for the museums is being dramatically cut back. And so the danger here is that, of course, the museums more and more can only afford to show those artists that are already being represented by the five or you know, 10 major international corporate galleries because the museum is so much in need of that financial support. So um, one thing I want to say, at least that's the case in Los Angeles, it's very much poo-pooed on uh, for a gallery to have a commercial solo show at the gallery concurrent with a museum show in that city. Uh, I, I find that's not true for all cities, and, and that is something that could change or should change, I think. Um, I, I think the biggest problem here is, is that there isn't enough money for museums available, and, um, and that's, of course, directly tied to people paying taxes. You know, and in the, in the United States, the production of art and the showing of art is very much dependent on the sale, sales of art. It's slightly different in Europe where artists can actually have a, a, a viable career based on government grants. Here, that is not the case. And so that is a problem. At the same time, I think people should not forget that museums and galleries, like what is actually shown in a museum and how is that uh, connected to the commercial side of the art world, there was always a very close connection there because museums traditionally have not been sending their curators out into the streets to find new talent that then shows up in the museum. It's usually that curators go to the galleries. So the galleries already created a commercial, commercially viable platform for art that was then shown in museums. What has dramatically changed right now is that the museums actually are being forced by the public to justify what they're showing. So no museum in the world right now can get away with showing, let's say, an all-white male program no matter the historical, art historical justification. That has changed. So I agree with Suzanne on that thing, seeing the point of view of Europe, because in Europe we've got publicly financed um, museums, but even in that case, 
the, the funding of, of the public museum and public culture is decreasing. I call it the privatization of culture, and it is the responsibility of, of our politicians to accept that principle, because they say, very often, even in Europe, they say, oh, culture is for the rich, so you know, they should take care of that by themselves. It's a big mistake, because, uh, of course, culture, when we agree again, is for everyone. Um, the thing is that because the public authorities are not there, the private gets in, and the, the private is the galleries. And then we go back to my thesis about the question, which is the initial question of that panel, is what's the future of the art market? Is, and I spoke about industrialization. This industrialization implies consolidation, consolidation of art fairs, consolidation of, um, of galleries. The galleries become bigger and bigger. Uh, I spoke about the 70% the small amount of the smaller galleries on that thing, and it happens the same way, that they, they poach as well the artist of the big, biggest quality that the smaller galleries are, are uh, presenting as well. So it's an evolution which is worrying and that must be countered in, in some way. Um, and, but in the case of the museum, it's only through public funding um, that it could happen. But it's, and you're totally right, I am, a collector, and I can tell you that there's not a show of contemporary artists almost anywhere in the world where I get the, the price offerings at the same time as the, the show is opening. Okay, um, unfortunately we're out of time now, but I want to just thank everybody for coming and thank our wonderful panelists. I think it's been a lively discussion. We could probably go on for another hour, but thank you again for coming. I really appreciate it.